Your goodness knows no bounds. Your goodness never stops. Your mercy follows me. Your kindness fills my life. Your love amazes me. And I sing because you are good. And I dance because you are good. And I shout because you are good.
Keep on getting better. Keep on getting better. 
Father, we just thank you that you are here in the midst of us. And some of you, do you feel like you just need to press past the distractions this morning and press through whatever's going on in our minds? And let's just look at Jesus face to face. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Just look at his eyes this morning. Just tell him how much you love him. Thank you, Jesus. I love you. I'm here because of you. There's no one in the world who's like you. You have changed my life more than anything. I love you this morning. I'm devoted to you. Come on, just have that conversation with him today. I'm not ashamed of you. I love you. I belong to you. There's no one greater than you. There's no one even beside you. Thank you, Lord. Just lift your hands this morning. I just feel his presence just sweeping in this room today. If you need a touch from the Lord today, if you need it in your physical body, if you need it in your mind, some of you, you've been dealing with so much anxiety this week that you haven't been able to find peace. And there's a peace that's sweeping in this room today that you've been waiting on all week. And here
here it is. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you that you're here in the still small voice. And I thank you that you're awakening your people. If you just feel dry this week, if you just feel whatever it is you're feeling, just draw near to him and say, I want to be close, Lord. I want to feel your presence. I want to know your heart. I want to be drawn in deeper. I'm going to tell you the goodness of God is here in this room this morning. And you may feel like you don't deserve it or you haven't earned it, and that's exactly why God wants to pour it out on you because it's not about what you can do. It's His goodness. It's His favor. It's His love that's here in this room this morning. Thank you, Holy Spirit. really feel like the enemy has just tried to come in, even with suicidal thoughts. This may be for you here in the room or maybe online today, but I want to tell you that it's a lie from the enemy. You belong to God, and there's nothing that you could do that could separate you from His love today. So we just take authority over those thoughts, over those words that have been spoken and we break off premature death. We break off suicidal spirits and thoughts in Jesus' name. We break off every scheme and every plan of the enemy in Jesus' name. And we release the spirit of life today. We release the spirit of hope today. We release purpose in this room today today. You were born for such a time as this. You were made by God, for God, to do the works of God. And there are mighty plans that God has for you. And so we shake off this heaviness. We shake off these roots in Jesus' name. And we uproot every evil assignment. And we declare that you were we're born for God. We call you out of darkness this morning and we call you into purpose. We call you into truth. We call you into the will and the plan of God. And we thank you, Holy Spirit. And some of you, you feel light right now. You feel that light coming in right now. And just lift your hands wherever you are. If you're in your room, in your car, in this room, lift your hands and the Holy Spirit is releasing you from that burden in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Isn't that so powerful about the presence of God that no matter where we are, he can take us from those thoughts, from those dark places, and bring us into hope and life. Can we just thank him for that this morning? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So, Father, I just pray over every person this morning. I pray that we would have ears to hear. Everyone say, ears to hear. Ears to hear what your spirit is saying. Sometimes the spirit is saying things that the natural man is not even saying. But, Lord, we want our spiritual hearts and eyes and ears to be awakened. We want to hear from heaven today. We want heaven to shift us. We want heaven to make us more like Jesus today. And we thank you for that. We thank you in Jesus' name. Be, I'll call it the CEO of your own life. Don't come to church and just think this is where I'm going to get what I need spiritually for the week. You need to dive in. You need to be reading some kind of book. You need to be in the Bible. You need to be on some type of growth plan with the Lord. Get in there. My growth plan is called prayer. And uh, I spend a, I've been spending a lot of time with the Lord because he's speaking right now. And so I just kind of entitled this Kingdom Glory. I've been actually preparing a lot of messages around this theme and just spending a lot, a lot of time. And this is what's, what's kind of cool. I don't spend a lot of time preparing messages for Sunday. I spend a lot of time with the Lord. 
And as I'm spending time with him, it just, he starts speaking things to me that I jot down. And at the end of the week, in our private time, he'll be like, he'll be speaking and teaching as I read. And he says, put this in Sunday, put this in Sunday. And then when I start putting it all together, it just is laid out. And I'm like, wow, Lord, that is phenomenal. I just love spending time with him. The word glory means this, the splendor, holiness, and majesty of God. That is what glory is, the splendor, holiness, and majesty of God. I've been to a lot of conferences and conventions that are called glory conferences, and they do not have the splendor, the holiness, or the majesty of God. I've been to some revival services that have no revival. But people are, and a lot of times people say that because they know that's what's coming, okay? That's what's coming. But here's the thing. It's great when that happens in the church. That's cool. I want it to happen in your life, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, yes, and Sunday morning. And when we really have revival meetings, it is revival meetings. When we have glory meetings, they're glory meetings. And when people leave, they're like, man, it was good. Well, who spoke? Oh, gosh, I forgot that person's name. But, man, the splendor, the holiness and majesty of God were there. When you do a business deal with somebody, the glory hits your meeting every day of your life. And so we'll jump into what I got. It's Psalms 24, 8 through 10. Oh, time out. So I've been asking just the Lord this. Okay, I remember there was a song written years ago. And it talked about the king of glory. We talk about Jesus. Okay, here's one thing I want to talk to you about today. This is so, this is, you're going to love all this. Has stop just quoting scripture and dive into the scripture. One of the most popular scriptures is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Everybody lies when they read that. You can't read that in faith and walk in fear. It kills fear. Well, if somebody reads that and they wear their shirts and then their, their own 18 different medicines and they're living in poverty and they're scared to death of their prophetic words that's not a real scripture to them the scripture has to become real to you every time i'm scared of a new prophetic assignment which i'm on a new one right now yeah i read this scripture and i'm like i can do all things through christ who strengthens me god opened this door and i'm gonna walk through it i'm gonna walk through it in style and i'm gonna walk in like i belong here because he opened the door and i do belong here even though mentally i don't think i belong there i'm not equipped but it's okay because he called me to walk in it and i'm gonna walk in it okay walk in like you own the word because he gave it to you see what happens is when you get a word you don't take ownership of the word you walk in fear but when you take ownership of the word you're going to be okay so I've been asking the Lord, Lord, explain this whole kingdom glory, the kingdom realm, the king of kings, heaven to earth, Matthew 6, 10, basically reveal the Bible to me. I'm tired of just hearing people talk about the Bible, but not experiencing the Bible. Okay, we say Jesus is alive. That means he should be manifesting. Are y'all tracking with me? And I'm just going to tell you, your life will never be the same after today. A little fired up today, Psalms 24, 8 through 10. And you ask, who is this king of glory? Yahweh armed and ready for battle Yahweh invincible in every way hang on I'm not talking about Mary's little lamb here I'm talking about a dude that likes to fight good word Joe thank you okay who is this king of glory he's a battling king a king that is ready for battle oh you mess with one of the king's kids you got a fight on your hand you know what I'm talking about? Who is this king of glory? Yahweh. He's armed and ready for battle. Whenever you go through something, you call on Yahweh. Now, now, hang on. Wait a minute. If he's a king and he's armed for battle, does that mean that he has an army? Well, why does the Bible talk about angels? You never hear people talk about angels or preach a lot about angels unless you listen to Tim Sheets and he talks about it all the time. But people talk about there's an angel army. You know what's funny? We're in here on Sunday, and I love hanging out with all these people, but do you know when I'm in prayer by myself in this room, I feel like this room is more full, and I honestly believe that I got angelic assistance here. I just feel the presence of the Lord. I'll never forget when, when Ezra comes up here, he won't go out the back way. He always wants to go through here, and, and sometimes he'd walk through the church, he would wave, and I said, are you waving at my friends? <laughs> he waving at he said, the angels, and I said, oh, yeah, oh, 
Okay. <laughs> and I wave too. And it is, my eyes are opening up to the things of the Lord. People say, man, that's some weird stuff. No, it's called Bible. You know, we, we, we've, we've watered down the Bible so much we actually don't believe when the word says, I can do all things. All is very simple. In the Greek, it means all. In the Hebrew, it means all. It means all in the English. It means all. I can do all things. But some people, I'm just trying to get some folks to do some things. <laughs> I can do some things who Christ, who strengthen me. No, I ain't what the word says. He says, I can do all things. Okay? And so, say, uh, Psalms 24, 9 so wake up, you live in gateways. Well, let's just stop. If a gate is shut, you can't go through it. When a gate is opened up, something can go through it. You are a gateway for the kingdom of God. You got to open up. How do you open up your mindset? When you open up your mindset that I can do more because I can become more. You know, it's like somebody who owns a business. When they get a new opportunity and they're maxed out, they can say no to it or they can adjust and, and buy and like hire more people or, or, or they can build. Um, where we're building our house, the people behind us have a very nice house, but they're, con they're constructing, they're adding on to an already established house because they want it bigger. Sometimes if you want to receive all the prophetic words, God gave you five words. You're stewarding two words. You got to allow God to create bigger in your mindset to walk in those three words. Some of y'all are setting on prophetic words that you're not doing anything with and you're scared to tell people. I knew nobody would help me, Jeff, on that one. But I I'm the same way. I got so many things in my life and I, and I tell them to people so they can remind me of them because I want to do it. Okay, so we're going to go on to verse 10. And you ask, who is this king of glory? He is Yahweh, armed and ready for battle. He is the mighty one, the invincible commander of the heaven's host. Heaven's host, it means he's not fighting alone. He is the king of glory. And the king of glory is about to come in and help you fight every single battle. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a list of all the battles that he's lost. They're right there. There's none of them. So how are you going to lose? The things that you're going through, the reason you lose is because you're fighting them. Man, it's like I'll pick a fight with the enemy like I ain't scared, and then I'll run behind Yahweh, and I get him. And I sit there. He's going to fight your battles, and he'll give you the strategy on how to fight the battle. Next time you're fighting a battle and you can't win, ask the Lord. He's going to tell you what to do. He'll show you. And listen, you have angelic hosts that help you. I remember years ago, I'm, I'm going to say probably... 20 years ago, I was at a church, and, and during the altar ministry, it was, you, know, you know, church, the altar was going for a while, I went way over in the very corner of the church, like way in the corner, and I got down on my hands and knees, and somebody, a powerful person, walked up and put their hand on my back, and I was just thinking, like, wow, I feel the power of God through this person, so I did the holy peak. I looked over here like this, and I was going to see, see what, what kind of, uh, of slacks or jeans or dress they were wearing so I could thank them for praying for me. And I looked down, this person had a white flowy dress on with no shoes. And so when I got done, I walked over to my friends, and I said, hey, man, I don't know who prayed for me, but some lady with the white flowy dress, and it was flowing, and, and she was barefooted. And they, I said, who was it? I got to go thank her. And they said, Joe, nobody was within 10 feet of you. I said, no, man. She literally, I felt her put her hands on me and pray for 10 minutes. And I don't know who she was, but I could see her dress flowing. He said, why would somebody's dress be flowing like this? I'm like, oh, man. And somebody said, it was an angel. I said, no, I don't know if they really exist or not. That's just nursery rhyme Christianity stuff. I was in my, my 20s, young 20s. And, and so I went and talked to some people about it. They were like, I don't know, never heard of anybody who knows anything about angels. I think, well, why in the world does the Bible talk about them so much? I guess they're real. I don't know. No one ever taught me about it. You know what you don't hear a lot in the church about demons? They don't talk about money. Well, what does the Bible talk about casting out demons? What does the Bible talk about angels, dreams, and visions? A lot of people don't talk about it, but it's all throughout the Bible. When we start believing the Word of God, this whole kingdom realm is going to um, open up to us, and you're going to operate in your life like never before. You know, tracking with me on this? Man, okay, so I was talking to the greatest person on planet Earth the other day, my wife, and we were talking about the kingdom of God. And she just says, oh, yeah, well, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. And I said, where'd you hear that? She said, the Bible. And I was like, 
Oh, girl, I knew that. I was just saying, if you knew that. And, uh, and I really I didn't. So it's in Romans 14, 17. It says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of rules about food and drink, but it is the realm of the Holy Spirit, okay? Trinity, God, Father, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was what? Sent. Sent from where? Heaven to earth, okay? And it's filled with righteousness, peace, and joy. This week, I have walked in so much peace. Even in pre-service prayer, I just felt the peace of God. Y'all feel the peace of God in here? You have to accept the peace of God. I know people that, here's the sad thing about a lot of times when I speak, or I'll be at a conference convention or a guest speaker, and while I'm preaching, the, it's not like the, the presence of God is, is falling, getting stronger and stronger, and people keep leaving and leaving and leaving, and they're missing their breakthrough because when the presence comes in, there's been a lot of times I've been in my private prayer and I'm about to leave, and I, and I always say this, Holy Spirit, are you, are, is there anything else you want to tell me? And a lot of times when I'm ready to leave, I think I'm done, the Holy Spirit will come on stronger and reveal more to me. And so the realm of the Holy Spirit is filled with righteousness, peace, and joy. This is the kingdom of God. We have to accept that. A lot of churches don't teach the kingdom of God because they've never been taught. It is in the word. There's a lot of things in the word that have never been taught a lot in churches. A lot of people don't teach this stuff. And this is what I'm diving into because I don't know about you, but I am so hungry for the things of God. I mean, it's like our world is, I was talking to a new friend of mine the other day and, and he said, Joe, there's so much confusion and trouble in the world, but you're not, not worried. I said, oh, no. Righteousness, peace, and joy is my portion. Because Catherine Coleman said this, she used to always say that the Holy Spirit is more real to me than any person. And if that is true in our lives, which it should be, we should allow the Holy Spirit to govern our lives. We shouldn't be caught up in all of the natural things that, that we see. And so by doing this, when something goes on in your life, Holy Spirit, what are you doing? Holy Spirit, what are you saying? And, and this is my heart. And I remember John Kilpatrick said this probably 20 years ago. He said on Saturday nights, he would have prayer time at the church by himself. And it was the most powerful revivals he would ever have, even more so than what he experienced at Brownsville. My private time with the Lord is the strongest presence of God I'm in all week. You should be the same way. You, the church service should never be stronger to you in your private time with God. Sad thing is a lot of people come to church and this is the spiritual highlight of their week. It is not. It is the early morning prayer. It's the late night prayer. It's the time when you spend the Lord. Like last night, Autumn and I went over to Tim and Carmen's and all the kids and them and we was all hanging out. That was good and that was fun. But when Autumn and I sit alone and talk, we have a deeper relationship and we talk about more than with everybody. Even though that was good and fun, tacos was great but the thing is when it's one-on-one -on -one, when it's you and the lord and he speaks you oh that was for this person over here no it was for you you're the only person in the room you got to cultivate that, that that walk with the lord and i remember probably about 20 years ago for 30 days in a row when i woke up i heard this th these words the more the more the more the more the more for 30 days and i said god i don't understand what is the more and the lord said for all the days of your life cry out for that god i want the more that you have to offer i want the more of your spirit and, and that's just the phrase he gave me the more and i just every day of my life i hunger for more and more of the lord and we're going to walk in it romans 2 and 4 it says, this is the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. You know, it is the goodness of God that will draw you by the beckoning of the Holy Spirit to go to that private place in prayer. And when you do that, you will experience the goodness of God. And when you walk out of that place of prayer, one of the things you do in prayer is you repent. And when you don't know what to pray for, just pray in the Spirit. When you don't know what to pray for, say, God, is there anything else that I need to pray for? And he will show you something. You offended at some guy 20 years ago. I'd be like, I ain't even thought about that old crazy joker. You just called him a crazy joker. I'm like, why are you all up in my business? And he'd say, because you asked me to be up in your business. And so I'll be like, you know, thank you, Lord. And I'll say, Lord, and the Lord will show me something. This is weird, but about a year ago, the Lord showed me. Somebody says something to me in the third grade, y'all. I've been out of school for a hot minute. And, 
And I said, in the third grade, I've been carrying something that some old nappy-headed person said in the third grade, and the Lord showed me, and I forgave him. <sighs> Freedom came in because I spent that time in the Lord repenting. See, a life on the altar is an altered life, and that is the fragrance. Think about the scriptures you, you hear about a lot in the Old Testament about the fragrance at the altar. When we are at the altar of God and our lives are being altered through repentance and prayer, that is the fragrance that he cannot resist. Your repentance and prayer is irresistible to God because it shows our dependence on him. Now, I'm going to give you a scripture that's so simple. I read it all the time. Think about this. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you, okay? Cleanse your hands, you sinners, okay? Think about this. First of all, are you 100% submitted to God and the things of the kingdom of God? And then you think about resist the devil. That means what reoccurring sin do you dabble in? That, that some people call it um, a stronghold. I don't. I call it your favorite sin. I know y'all don't have those, okay? But some people do. And so you have a favorite sin, well, then therefore this scripture is null and void to you because you're not really submitted to God. But the word says when you submit to God, you fully resist the devil, and he knows he can't win. He's going to leave you alone for a season. But you pull closer to God, you're fighting in God. Remember Yahweh, mighty in battle? That's who I'm talking about. And see, so the closer you get, the closer you get to God and the closer he gets to you. But, but go back to this part in verse 8. What did it say? Cleanse your hands, you sinner. Let's go back to repentance. As you're repenting, and it's that fragrance coming off the altar, God is going to heaven to earth you, and he's going to draw so close to you, you're going to walk in the kingdom, which is, remember, the, you know, the righteousness, but you're going to have peace. You can be walking through a storm and peace. I like those commercials. There's a bunch of them, but somebody's walking like this, like George Jefferson walking, and all of a sudden buildings are blowing up and fires and tornadoes are behind them, and they're just walking around like this. They're full of the kingdom of God because when the earthly realm is falling apart, they're rooted in the kingdom. Those are the people. They're going to just do great exploits for the Lord. You know, I, I'm big on inventions and entrepreneuring and wise investments. And God is looking for people to trust, to give the right new businesses, the right investments. Why? Because we have to fund the kingdom of God. We shouldn't have church people going after earth, worldly businesses to ask for money. We should be able to fund our own people. You know what I'm saying? Now think about this, Luke 4, 43 and he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to all the other cities. This is Jesus, because this was the purpose that I was sent. Do you know 99% of churches, and this is correct to a degree, they preach that Jesus came to earth. Why? To die on the cross for our sins. He did. He came to die on the cross for our sins. You know, the spotless lamb. We know that. But then why did he say, I must preach the kingdom to all the other cities? Because this is the purpose I was sent. He could have died at birth if that was the reason. But no. For 33 and a half years, he taught and preached the kingdom of God. It, he's, this, is, this is where my mind, I, I can't comprehend this. I never heard about the kingdom of God until a few years ago. And I'm 47 years young. And the thing is, Jesus himself, and I've read over this. See, we read over scriptures and don't even understand it. That I've came to, this is the purpose I was sent, to preach the kingdom of God. If Jesus came to preach the kingdom of God, shouldn't we all learn what the kingdom of God truly is and start teaching that? This is what we must teach. It is a forgotten message in the church. And then when a few apostolic folks about 20 years ago started bringing this message up, the church tried to crucify them because they didn't want this message preached. But it's the same message that Jesus said he came to preach. You know, if you start preaching the kingdom of God, the worldly folks, they love it. The church people don't like it. Because when you talk about uh, the kingdom of God, you know what every kingdom has? A king, and you aren't on the throne, and neither am I. And so when you um, understand that you're not on the throne of your own life, everything changes. But in a good way. Because when you are under the headship of the king, you also have the king's authority. And he has given us that authority. And let me tell you what the king said. He said, oh, to my church, my ecclesia, you're going to do greater things than I've ever done. 
if we get the kingdom and we understand it. You're about to walk, you know, over the past two months, Tim gave this word one time, Mr. Harmson gave this word, I've shed it. Clarity. We're about to walk in such clarity, there'll be no confusion. The word even says there is no confusion in my name, but only peace. Wait a minute. Peace was one of the three things that he attributed to the kingdom of God. You're tracking with me? A lot of times, if you're not in peace, you're not operating in the kingdom. You're operating in this natural realm. All right, I'm going to keep going because I am loving this. 1 Corinthians 2.14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolish to him. If I had a dollar for every time somebody talked to me about revival, awakening, the kingdom of God, apostolic, prophetic ministry, and said, that's silly, that makes no sense, I would be, uh, I don't know how much money, but we'd be paying cash for a lot of stuff. You know, but no, no, no. And I remember one time this guy came up to me after revival service. I was, he, was, he worked at a church. He was actually the youth pastor at the church I was speaking at. And, and they called me in the office to have a meeting. Boy, I've had a lot of those after I preached. And, and he said, I, we are so frustrated. We do not believe a single thing that you said up there. You are preaching an erroneous doctrine to what we believe. And I'm just like this. Yeah? And then the youth pastor said, but everything you said was straight out of the Bible. I'm like, yeah, it's kind of where I get most of my stuff. And they were like, everything you said, you backed it up with Scripture. And they said, everything we've been taught, we think is, a, is not true. I said, do you know the Bible? We start quoting Scriptures and talking about Scriptures. They had no idea what the Scriptures is. And, and these leaders, great, great people that love, love people and they love the Lord, they were never taught what, what the actual Word of God says. Listen. Whoever preaches up here on Sundays, we have a lot of phenomenal speakers. Don't take their word for what they say. Study to show yourself approved. I remember when I was in my 20s, I preached something like this, preaching, sweat pouring, fire going. And I read the word the next week. I preached it wrong. I was like 21. And I, I got, God, I preached wrong. I, I'm just, I preached that wrong. I misread that scripture. I'm sorry. And they were like, it's okay. Thanks for being honest. <laughs> I think I might have preached something wrong that week too. I was young, man. I, I, I knew like four scriptures. Jesus swept was the first one. And I was just going for it, man. I just love the Lord. And, and so you need to study to show yourself approved. You know, a lot of people, when they try to come at me with different things like the, uh, with theology and stuff, I'm like, where, where, in the, where in the world did you hear that? Well, this one preacher, I said, eh, give me a scripture. Give me a verse. Everything has to be scripture and verse. And, and, and they were like, well, well, this one guy said, I'm like, well, 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 this one guy doesn't have any fruit. The Bible says every tree is known by its fruit. The Bible is where you're planted because when you're planted in the word of God, you'll be so fruitful. Your one little seed will turn into an orchard overnight. You know what I'm saying? And so you got to know the word of God. And what, listen, when you, why is the Bible called a sword? Because it is a weapon. We don't use, we're sitting there getting whooped. And we got a weapon. Blow the dust off that weapon grandmama gave you. You know, some of y'all got 10 Bibles in your house and you're losing battles. You got weapons everywhere around you. Pull them out. And, and listen, thank God for Google. It's got a few good things about it. But, but if you're going through something, if you're going through depression, Google five scriptures on depression. It'll give you five scriptures. Google knows the Bible. Some people don't know the Bible. Google knows the Bible. If you're under some type of, of attack, Google it, man. So, somebody has posted something that you can go and, and, and know these scriptures. And, and this is my opinion, and, and I'm right. If you don't like it, just forgive me. But um, if you're losing in, in life and losing a lot of battles, it's your fault. Man, I tell you, you got to become a fighter. Nothing can take you out. Yeah, it can knock you down. I've been, I get knocked down weekly, but I'm like a wibble wobble. Uh, you know, wibble wobble, the little clowns, they got that big smile. You can hit them, and they, if, y'all, if you're under 40, you don't know what I'm talking about. But you hit them, and they fall down. They come right back up, and they still smiling. You can punch them, kick them, whatever. They just, <laughs> I got so mad at mine, I stabbed it in its face one time, and it, the air was coming out of it, but it was waving at me, smiling, going down. And uh, you just got to be like that. Listen, God's got you. You got you, man. Well, we got to understand this, and Matthew 6 and 10 in the Passion 
It says, manifest your kingdom realm and cause your every purpose to be fulfilled on earth just as it is in heaven. Every heavenly prophetic word that has been given to you, every dream that's in your heart from, the, from God has to be carried out on the earth. And when we understand these scriptures that we learned as kids and dive into them, we will understand. And so I was talking to, I had this, this uh, new friend of mine, I was talking to him on the phone the other day, he asked me, he said, where do you learn all this about the kingdom? I said, the Lord. He said, do you not read a book on all this stuff? I said, no, the Lord gave it to me. And he's like, how does the Lord give you this? I said, Matthew 16, 13 through 19. And Jesus came to them in the region of Caesarea Philippi and asked the disciples, you know, who do men say that I am? You know, and they said, well, some of y'all say you're John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, you know, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And he said, well, who do you say I am? Simon Peter, always going to say something. Might be right, might be wrong, but Peter's going to say something. Peter stepped up and said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Jesus said, stop. And he answered them and said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. See, no one had told them that's who he was. God gave them that revelation. And he was so bold. He said, this is who you are. You are the Christ. And Jesus was like, whoa. Whoa. Where did you learn this revelation, man? No one's teaching this stuff. He said, your father told me. Daddy told me something about you. And the father heard it. Listen, you can hear a lot of great messages and read a lot of good books. But when you get a word from him, it changes. And you got to understand, you got to stand. I used to stand on stuff that God gave me. And people would say stuff. And I even worked at churches. And they came against me for saying it. And they would say, take it back. And I said, no, I ain't taking it back. You know, and I said, this is what the Lord said. And guess what happened years later? The word I said came to pass. It came to pass. When you hear a word from God, stand on it. Stand on it. I remember when I met Autumn, I told three people, two of them being preachers, that we were going to get married. And um, all three of them said, there's no way a girl like that would marry a guy like you. And I, and I said, okay. And I prayed, and the Lord said, no, you're going to be married. It's going to be great. And I said, okay. I stood on the word. Man, when I got called in to, to preach, man, I used to stutter. I, had, <laughs> I was the least likely person to be a minister. And least likely. But you know what? I stood on that word, even though people made fun of me. And they said, what are you going to do? You're going to be like, J -j 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 Jesus loves you. And I said, well, well, if I have to. You know, I didn't know. I just did. I just what was in my heart. And so you got to learn to stand on that. And, and that's why Jesus, he loved Peter so much. You know, it's crazy because people always say, well, you ready for this part? People always say, why would God use Peter? He denied Christ three times. He was cussing. He was acting ignorant, but he knew the kingdom. He just didn't know Jesus. He knew the kingdom. See, he, he just didn't, he just wasn't taught. He caught the message. Do you know why? You can be in churches and some people prosper and some people don't. Some people want to be taught. Some get in there and catch what's moving in the spirit. The kingdom of God, what was this? It was by the Holy Spirit. You can walk in a church. When I go to conferences or conventions sometimes, there's times that the, the speakers are like really good and all, but I don't go to hear somebody. I go to catch something. Because all ministers carry an anointing of something. And, and there's sometimes, I just want to be around certain people. And this is funny. Y'all might think this is funny. But when, when I sit at tables and eat with, with ministers that I respect, I don't talk. And they're like, D do you not ever talk? And I'm like, see, mama, first thing you see, he's acting up. <laughs> it's because I don't want to talk. I don't want to waste one minute. I want to receive everything I can. I just want to receive from people. And so I, do, I don't talk. And they ask me a question, I'll give a short answer. I want them to talk because I want to hear, okay? Let's get back to Matthew 16. I love this right here. Verse 18. And then Jesus says, And also I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Why did he say I would build my church upon you? Because he understood the kingdom of God. Y'all tracking with me? 
You want God to build on all the prophetic words that he gave you? Understand the kingdom and your life will shift drastically. The greatest blessings that God wants to bestow upon you, he, he's not going to fully release until you understand his kingdom. Because a lot of people, hey, this is crazy. I've talked to some business people that I don't even know if they know Yahweh, Jesus, Jesus. I don't think they really know him. They are so kingdom-minded, it is absolutely ridiculous the way they operate. And when I listen to some these people talk, I think that they're preaching a message because they understand what the Bible says without quoting chapters and verse. Do you know how many worldly, very, very prominent people use the Word of God? Miles Monroe says this, it's so good. He says, the Bible is a spiritual book, but equally, it is a book of principles. Do you know how many people that don't profess to be Christians use the Bible as a guideline? And a lot of times the church only makes the Bible a spiritual book, but they don't use any application to their life with it. Therefore, they struggle. Um, Matt's hero, Jim Rohn, said that the Bible is a spiritual book, and it's a book of principles. And he said, if you will follow the principles... And I was listening to a motivational talk by a bunch of different people one day. And, and these different businessmen that were Christians were like, when they go into business meetings, the majority of what people teach is the Bible. They just don't do chapters and verses. Because they said there was no greater book on how to live your life properly than the Word. That's why I don't understand how Christians, how they don't thrive in life. Because we don't take the Word and we don't make it literal, Okay. And so now, I said all that for this verse, Matthew 16, 19. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Okay, we're going to stop. If he's going to give us the keys of the kingdom of heaven, how many times in the Bible have you read doors, gates, and windows of heaven will be opened unto you? Most windows open from the inside, not the outside, correct? If you got a key, you can go through the door and open the window. But when you open the window, how about if you open the window and it's not for you, it's for everybody around you? Y'all tracking with me? I'm opening every window, every door, anything I can, every vent in the house. I'm opening every revelation I can to help other people. And it says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, not just a house, but to the whole entire kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. If you and me could grab that scripture and understand it, I don't fully understand it. If we could understand it, our worlds would be changed. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, for years, this was my altar scripture. Kind of still is. Matthew 18, 18 and 20. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, have you ever wondered why you have a prayer team? <laughs> that scripture right there. Prayer person, number one. Person coming for prayer. Prayer person, number two. Two people. What do you need prayer for? I need healing in my right ankle. Okay, the word just says this right here. And, and you quote that scripture and you pray over that. Two people coming together. That's why I love people praying for one another. When we can understand this scripture right here, it changes everything. You want to talk about healing scripture? That's a scripture. You want to talk about um, financial breakthrough, prodigal sons and daughters coming home, two people, husband and wife, praying for a prodigal to come home. People in the church getting together praying for church prodigals to come home. People to break generational curses. Two people come in together. You just need a prayer partner. You need somebody who, who, can, who will get in the trenches with you. They will pull you out of a ditch. They, you just need somebody to pray. So again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven for where two or three are gathered in my name, I will be in the midst of them. In the midst of them, the kingdom of God. The king of the kingdom will be in the midst of us. The kingdom, the Holy Spirit realm, 
righteousness, peace, and joy. You should be able to be in the biggest circumstance and situations of your life and go to sleep with peace because you're operating in that kingdom realm. Oh, yeah. So, now this is my opinion. This is not biblical, but this is my opinion. And I do think I'm right. But all the disciples were martyred, right? Besides one, John the Beloved. Not Peter the crazy wild man. Not, not anybody else, not Matthew, not them. It was John the Beloved. And, and I heard a preacher say this one time, and I, I, I think this could be true, my, my thought. But I think Jesus couldn't stand to watch John the Beloved. What did John understand? Read John's words. John understood the kingdom. Why? He was the disciple that what? Put his head on Christ's chest. What, what does the chest represent? The heartbeat. He understood the heartbeat of Christ. I'll tell you another opinion I have. I think John was martyred and he died, they said, of natural causes of older age. Why? Because he still taught the kingdom of God. He was still preaching and his assignment wasn't done. A lot of times people may stop recording a lot of things about your life, but your assignment is not done. Some of you may think you're forgotten, but you're not done. Now Malachi 3 and 10, no, I'm not going to take up an offering right here. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. We know that part. It says, the Lord of hosts, this is why. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven, okay? Now, this is, this is the word. He's going to open the windows. Now, we got keys in another scripture. There's a bunch of windows about to be opened, okay? And it says, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that you do not have room enough to receive it. Do you know why a lot of people don't feel that they're blessed? Y'all ready for this? Right here. You can't believe it right here. I actually had somebody tell me the other day, I really don't think I'm worthy to receive all these blessings. I said, oh, you're not. So give me the ones that you don't feel worthy for because I do. And so a lot of times people say, I don't think I should, I just don't think I'm worthy of these blessings. You don't have room enough to receive. Wouldn't it be sad if when, when you get to heaven, the Lord showed you everything they had for you, but your mental capacity, because maybe somewhere um, your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, it had just been taught down that, that maybe some people, three, four generations came from another nation or they walked in extreme poverty and you never had an abundance mindset. Like when I pray for people, I don't think God wants to heal 20%. I'm going for 110, the carryover when they leave. You know, I, I believe... That, that everything God has for me, I'm going to have because when I steward kingdom's treasures, I benefit the kingdom. It's not about me. Let me tell you the biggest problem in Christianity. We're so focused on ourselves, we forget about the kingdom. We're the kingdom. Wrong. It's not about you. It's a, Jesus never did anything selfish. He always, he was probably tired, but he went away at, to pray. He was still probably tired, but he got up early in the morning, went to a solitary place, Mark 135, where he prayed. He was always trying to advance the kingdom. And so when this scripture says, I will open up the windows of heaven and pour out on you a blessing that you don't have room enough to receive, what is your, your job to get yourself in position to receive everything? Remember the story about the widow and her two sons and the man of God? He said, go get every pot, pans, vases, coffee cups. I made that part up. Um, and, and I'm going to pour you out a blessing. And so, and so the blessing was being poured out and the little woman and the two sons were ecstatic and the man of God was he, he was, he couldn't understand why they limited God to just a few pots and pans and vases and coffee cups. He said, you, I said, God is about to pour out on your life. And she said, well, I've always been in poverty basically and I thought this was a, a lot. He said, in the natural realm, but in the kingdom realm, it's just a drop in the bucket and that's all you're going to receive is a drop in the bucket because you didn't believe to receive. Y'all tracking with me on this? Some of y'all, if, if you could see who I'm preaching to, y'all, I mean, it'd blow your mind. I see, when, when, when I pray for you guys, I don't pray where you're at. I pray for every dream you've told me about you. And, and, and so, it just, it just blows my mind how a lot of times we've been taught such lack Listen, some of you are called to encourage and to write and do videos and build businesses. And, and, and if you could understand this main concept right here, 
you are a son or a daughter of the Most High God. Now, understand that because a lot of people say, well, I, I, was, um, I didn't have a good mom, a good dad. Um, maybe some of y'all been divorced and remarried. And, well, I was really wounded by a spouse or a teacher or a coach hurt me, all this stuff. Listen, somehow you got to get with God and get all of that removed and understand you are a child. We learned this in, in, in like kids' church. You're a child of the king. And they're like, yeah, and they wear funny hats when they come out of kids' church. But they, they, that, you got to understand, you are a child of the king. And so one of the funniest, weirdest things that ever happened to me, I was at a conference one time, and, and, and I was actually hosting the conference, but this guy was talking about illegitimacy. I didn't know what that word meant. So I just went up there. And, you know, I got a pretty good dad and, and a good mom and, and good family. But there was, you know, the Bible says there's nobody perfect, no, not one. So everybody has a lack inside of them. And I remember when they guy started praying, you know how people get slain in the spirit? I, I got crumpled in the spirit. I look like that wibble wobble that I stabbed. And, and I went down like this. I was laid over, just laid over, like weird shaped. God did something to me that day, changed my life that day. And they helped me up. I, f I felt like a slinky. I was like coming up. I was like, what in the world just happened? And the speaker said, I have never seen anybody go straight down like that before. It was so powerful. And the Lord did something in me. In every little hole and crooked place, he started filling them. And all these years later, I'm still getting holes filled inside of me. Cracks are, are, are being healed. You know, Another thing is the Lord is pouring out, but you got so many cracks and holes in you, it just keeps going right through you. You can't receive. When you get filled up and, and you allow him to heal every crack and crevice, you start to overflow. And listen, that overflow, everybody you come in contact with will, will receive the overflow of the Lord. And when you have a kingdom mindset, it's going to be good. And so, last thing probably, breakthrough it's not a one-time event. It's, it's a lifestyle. And I have a, a real good friend of mine we're talking about a lot. We preach a lot of breakthrough conferences, and I love preaching those because they're so fun. And then and I remember I told him at this one conference, I said, man, this is a great conference. Well, until next time. They said, what do you mean next time? I said, well, we got to do another one. They said, what do you mean? I said, well, we, we got to teach them how to live breakthrough. Nobody talked about living breakthrough. Come up the altar. Let's just lay holy hands and slap some oil. So much oil running down your face, you run your new shirt you bought for the conference and get your breakthrough and then come back and get another breakthrough at the next conference. I said, quit teaching that stuff. Teach them how to go alone at their house and teach breakthrough. Walk. You are, a, you're living, your everyday life is a breakthrough. Is this making sense too? You don't have to come. You come to the altar to get breakthrough from one thing. But then you go home and you learn how to steward that relationship that you live in a breakthrough. What is that? That is the kingdom glory coming down. That every day you will walk in the splendor, the holiness, and the majesty of God with righteousness and peace and joy as your portion. That if somebody says, who needs a breakthrough? Everybody's looking at them like, I, I, I daily walk in this stuff. I know how to go get my own breakthrough. Yes, breakthroughs are important and will always, 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 and I'll always give altar calls for that, but if you're the one getting a breakthrough every week, you're not stewarding it at home. We need people that are made whole for the kingdom of God to go out and minister to people. Okay, now, I'll always take prayer for things. I'll, I'll always respond if I need an immediate breakthrough for something. But listen, it is not a one-time event. It is a lifestyle. And I'm telling you, the kingdom glory that God is pouring out is your portion. I don't know if you know who Gina Ghostin is. She's a real prophetic dreamer. Uh, Apostle Dutch, she's talked about a lot of stuff. And she's had some pretty, pretty cool dreams recently. And one of them was, and she just professed that the shift that is coming to our great nation is here. It is not coming. It is here. And she said the problem is a lot of people won't even step into it. The church world as a whole has wanted good church. No, good lifestyle is what it is, kingdom lifestyle. When you go to a restaurant, when you go to Walmart, sometimes I feel I'm supposed to go in those crazy places. Walmart pickup is of Jesus, but sometimes I'll go in. And you can't walk in the door without seeing five people who are lost, hurt, broken, and desperately need somebody to stop what they're doing and go just give them a word, love on them, slide them a 20, 
whatever it may be. Don't ever go to Walmart without cash in your pocket because somebody in there needs a blessing. And when you got a 20, this is what's crazy. When you give somebody a 20 and you hold their hand and you still got your thumb on it, you can pray and prophesy for them as long as you want because they will not let go of your hand until you release that 20 spot. So I will pay somebody $20 to give me, give me a word. You know, I walk in to give them a word. I walk in there, I pray for people. And you can see they're trying to get that 20 with their pinky. No, I'm going to give this word all the way out because you're going to receive what the Lord has and then I give it to them. Because that word that was deposited in them was worth me paying $20 for it. That's just how we roll sometimes. So, Lord, I just thank you for this day. And, Lord, I just know that your love for every one of us is so powerful and so great. And, Lord, I just know you want to minister to every heart and life in here in such a powerful, powerful, powerful way. I pray that we we hear you, we know you, we follow you. Okay, this is from the Lord. This is for a few folks. Just give up and just do it. (laughs) Just give up and just do it. And then for some people, in your mind, you've been trying to battle things, and the Holy Spirit is a firewall. He will not let you get past it. Uh Uh-uh. We're going to deal with this, okay? We're going to deal with it. And it's like you're, you're trying to move forward in life. But there is a firewall, which is the Holy Spirit, that will not let your old mindset get past. You can't steward the new with the old mind. I declared over people today. And I just declared that people are going to walk in the kingdom of God at a greater dimension than ever before. They're going to understand the word of the Lord, and we're going to walk in all that you have for us, Lord.